welcome to our on-demand webinar on best practices for student surveys. My name is Dr. Megan Pollock, and I'll be your host. Whether you're an educator, administrator, or stakeholder, this resource is designed to guide you in creating effective and inclusive surveys to better understand the student experience. In this session, we'll explore how surveys play a pivotal role in enhancing educational programs by capturing accurate student needs and experiences. Our journey will cover the CARES principle for effective survey design and delve into four crucial areas for developing impactful student surveys. So let's get started on this insightful journey together to make our educational environments more inclusive and responsive to every student's voice. Now, the first thing that I want to reference is that there is a, an accompanying PDF to this resource um, that was created for NAEP, the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity, and funded by the Toyota Foundation. A special thanks also to Mimi Lufkin for her support and its creation. So again, I encourage you to access this resource as a companion tool for this webinar. Before we get started and dive into all of the 29 best practices, let me ask you, I know you care, but does your survey? One quick and easy way to remember the highlights from this resource is the foundational CARES principle. It's a mnemonic that encapsulates the key elements of effective survey design and administration. CARE stands for concise, accessible, relevant, ethical, and simple. Concise means that we aim to respect the respondent's time by focusing on essential questions, avoiding overwhelming and deterring participation. Accessible, that means it's crucial that our surveys are easily nav navigable and understandable by everyone, ensuring that no student's voice is left unheard due to accessibility barriers. Next is relevant. Every question should serve a purpose, directly contributing to our survey's objectives and helping us to gather meaningful data. Next is ethical. We adhere to the highest ethical standards, respecting our respondents' privacy, obtaining informed consent, and ensuring confidentiality. And next is simple. Utilizing clear and straightforward language is key to avoiding misunderstandings and ensuring that all participants can accurately express their opinions. So adhering to the CARES principle ensures our surveys are not only effective, but also respectful and inclusive of all participants. Now let's dig a little deeper and frame the overview of the best practices. Now, when I was outlining the many best practices from the literature, I wanted to find a way to organize them and make it easier to apply them. So I've created four groups for your consideration. In our first focus area, design, we explore the art of crafting survey questions and structures. Effective design means creating questions that are relevant, clear, and unbiased, truly aligning with your survey's core objectives. We'll discuss how to define clear objectives, ensuring each question is necessary and contributes valuable insights. Additionally, we'll cover the importance of using simple language, avoiding leading or compound questions, and the value of pilot testing. This section is your guide to constructing surveys that accurately and ethically capture the student experience. Moving on to distribution and accessibility, we emphasize reaching a diverse student population and ensuring every student can easily access and complete your survey. This section offers strategies for effective distribution, highlighting the importance of survey timing, reminders, and even incentives. We also discuss the necessity of making your survey accessible to students with disabilities, ensuring inclusivity is at the forefront of your distribution efforts. By focusing on these aspects, we aim to achieve higher response rates and more representative data. Our next critical area, ethics and sensitivity, underscores the importance of conducting surveys with a strong ethical foundation. We delve into the principles of informed consent, anonymity, and confidentiality, especially pertinent for surveys addressing sensitive topics or diverse populations. This section guides you through designing questions with cultural sensitivity and placing demographic questions strategically to minimize bias and stereotype threat. Upholding these ethical standards ensures that our surveys respect and protect participants' rights and dignity. Finally, in analysis and feedback, we explore how to effectively analyze survey data and share findings with stakeholders. 
This section provides insights into preparing data for analysis, the importance of developing a clear analysis plan, and seeking assistance when necessary. We also emphasize the value of feedback, discussing how sharing survey results can enhance engagement and trust among participants. Through thoughtful analysis and feedback, we can close the feedback loop, driving continuous improvement in our educational practices. Now, in this first section of best practices, we focus on the cornerstone of any effective survey, its design. A well-designed survey not only captures accurate and relevant data, but also respects the time and cognitive load of its respondents. So let's dive into the best practices for designing your survey. First up, clear objectives. The foundation of a powerful survey lies in its objectives. Each survey should start with a clear definition of its purpose. What information are you seeking? Why is this information important? If you're focused on career and technical education and special populations, why specifically are you trying to ask this information from your students and what are you trying to solve? A well-defined purpose guides the creation of every question, ensuring that each serves a direct role in achieving your survey's goals. So when we lead clients through process improvement protocols, surveys are usually tools that we use to identify root causes so that we can address them and facilitate meaningful change. <clears throat> we encourage people to establish hypotheses that they want to test to either validate or disprove. So your objective is just that, to validate or disprove your hypotheses. Now, if you don't have hypotheses and you're just gathering information, then your objective can still and should be tightly defined. Here's an example of defining clear objectives. Suppose you're conducting a survey to improve an online learning platform. Here's how clear objectives might be defined. First, purpose, to evaluate the effectiveness of the online learning platform and facilitating student learning and engagement. Your objectives might be, one, to measure student satisfaction with the online learning platform. Two, identify specific features of the platform that enhance or hinder learning. Three, to assess the ease of navigation and accessibility of the platform for students. Four, to gather suggestions from students for improving the platform. And five, to determine the impact of the platform on students' academic performance. By defining clear objectives, you ensure that your survey is purpose-driven and capable of collecting meaningful data that can inform decisions and actions. The next design best practice is relevant questions. Relevance is key. Every question should directly contribute to your survey's objectives, helping you validate or disprove your hypotheses. This focus helps avoid the inclusion of unnecessary questions that could extend the survey needlessly, potentially leading to respondent fatigue and disengagement. After years of working with educators, we have learned that one of the bottlenecks in our program improvement efforts is supporting educators in crafting surveys that help uncover root causes. So designed with educators' needs in mind, our comprehensive guide and innovative survey generator offer a suite of solutions. So we encourage you to check out our CTE and STEM student survey generator to help you create a targeted survey that is, can help you really address and understand the root causes. If you're interested in more resources and training on this, please check the comments uh, for more information and resources. The next design best practice is simple language. Here, clarity is your ally. Use language that's easily understood by all respondents. Avoid jargon, technical terms, or complex phrases. Tools like ChatGPT by OpenAI can assist in simplifying language, ensuring your questions are accessible to everyone. The next design best practice is brevity. Most importantly, respect your respondents' time. Keep your survey concise to prevent fatigue and ensure high quality responses. A shorter, well-constructed survey often yields better engagement and more accurate data. The next design best practice is to avoid leading questions. Objectivity is crucial, so frame your questions neutrally to avoid leading respondents to a particular answer. This ensures that the data collected reflects genuine opinions and experiences. The next 
design best practice is to avoid compound questions. So here, focus is essential. Ensure that each question addresses a single topic. Compound questions, which tackle multiple issues at once, can confuse respondents and muddle your data. The next design best practice is pilot testing. Before launching your survey widely, conduct a small pilot test with a group of students. This step is invaluable for identifying issues with question clarity, survey length, or technical glitches, enabling adjustments that can enhance the overall survey experience. So here's an example for both pilot testing and compound questions. Imagine you've created a fantastic survey to understand student satisfaction with virtual learning. Before broad dissemination, you conduct a pilot test with a small group of students. They report confusion over a question that asks, how satisfied are you with the access to and quality of virtual learning resources and support? The feedback reveals that access to and quality of are seen as separate issues by the students. Based on this, you split the question into two distinct parts, one focusing on access and the other on quality. This simple adjustment, a form informed by pilot testing, significantly improves the clarity and usefulness of the responses. The next design best practice is technical reliability. Utilize reliable online survey tools capable of handling the expected volume of responses without issues. Platforms like Google Forms, SurveyMonkey, Qualtrics, and Typeform are popular choices, each offering unique features and levels of customization. The next design best practice is the use of Likert scales. For capturing, for capturing nuanced opinions, Likert scales are incredibly effective. These scales, typically ranging from strongly agree to strongly disagree with a neutral midpoint, allow for a detailed view of respondents' attitudes. Now, many people want to skip the neutral midpoint because they think that they don't want people to have a neutral opinion. But the research shows that it is a more effective data analysis tool for you to include a neutral midpoint. So as an example, suppose you're evaluating student attitudes towards a new online learning platform. We'll kind of keep with the theme here. To gauge the nuance of their opinions, you use a Likert scale with statements like, the online learning platform is easy to navigate. Respondents can choose from strongly agree to strongly disagree, including a neutral opinion. This approach reveals not just positive or negative attitudes, but the strength of those feelings providing clear direction or improvements. Now, if you're curious about Likert scales, there are lots of different kinds of Likert scales. Here on the screen are some examples. So you can measure satisfaction, agreement, frequency, quality, or likelihood. These are, again, just some examples, but again, all of them have this neutral midpoint for you to include for, again, stronger data. Now, the next design best practice is consistency in scales. So you want to maintain uniform scale directionality across your survey to facilitate accurate measurement and comparison. Now, what this means is that you're not going to have strongly agree on the right side for half the questions, and then you're going to switch strongly agree to the, uh, to the other side for another set of questions. That's not consistent. If people kind of get into the rhythm of selecting, you know, one side, you again want to have that consistency that the positive side or the, the agreement side is always going to be on one end and the disagreement is always going to be on the other. The next best practice is positive language. Wherever possible, use positive language in your questions. This approach simplifies understanding and avoids the cognitive load associated with processing negatives or double negatives. The next design best practice is varied question framing for validation. To increase the, reli to increase the reliability of your responses, you want to frame similar questions in varied ways. This method, including both positive and negative statements, helps to verify the consistency of responses. The next, the next, best, the next design best practice is balanced question design. Ensure that the design of response options is balanced with each option occupying equal visual space. So this balance aids in avoiding bias and ensuring that respondents are guided solely by the participants' views. 
The final design best practice is strategic question placement. You want to capture your respondents' attention by placing the most critical survey items at the beginning. This strategy ensures that you collect key data, even from those who may not complete the survey. Now, adhering to these design best practices will elevate the quality and effectiveness of your data collection efforts. It's not just about asking questions. About, it's about asking the right questions in the right way. As we move forward, remember that each decision in the design process should be intentional, reflecting a commitment to understanding and improving the educational experiences of all students. Now, in this segment, we turn our attention to the vital aspects of distribution and accessibility in survey design. How we share our survey and ensure it's accessible to every student plays a significant role in the quality and inclusivity of the data we collect. Let's explore best practices to make sure our surveys reach as many students as possible and allow everyone to participate. First up, multiple formats. Diversity in survey formats is key to accommodating the varied preferences and access issues of our student body. Whenever possible, offer your survey in multiple formats, such as online for digital ease and paper-based for those with limited internet access. This approach ensures that every student has the opportunity to participate regardless of their access to, 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 to technology. So as an example, ensure that your survey reaches all students, including those with limited internet access. To, to do this, you distribute the uh, both online and in paper format. For instance, a university looking to gauge campus dining satisfaction offers an online survey link via email or QR codes in dining halls alongside paper surveys at the entrance with a Dropbox for completed forms. This dual approach results in a higher response rate and more inclusive data. And look, I hear you. You're thinking, no, I don't want to have to type in all that data. But best practice shows that multiple formats is going to help you again have a higher response rate and more inclusive data collection. The next distribution and accessibility best practice is accessibility. So you want to ensure that your survey is accessible to all students, including those with disabilities. This is a fundamental requirement. This might mean providing surveys in alternative formats, such as Braille or large print, or offering assistance to those who need it. Accessibility features on digital platforms, such as screen reader compatibility and alter alternative text for images are also crucial. Making your survey accessible underscores the principle that every voice matters. So as an example, say that you are you have a survey for campus accessibility issues and you ensure that the online form is fully accessible, including to those using screen readers and to those who experience color blindness. You also provide a version with larger print for those with visual impairments and ensure there's a straightforward way for students to request other formats if needed. This level of accessibility consideration ensures that all students, regardless of disability or ability, can share their experiences and contribute to making the campus more accessible for everyone. The next distribution and accessibility best practice is timing and scheduling. The timing of your survey distribution can significantly impact response rates. To maximize participation, avoid busy period, periods like exams or holidays and align the survey distribution with the academic calendar. A typical duration for survey avail availability is one to two weeks, providing ample time for participation without lingering so long that it's forgotten. It also gives a little bit of urgency like, oh, I need to do this now and not put this off. The next distribution and accessibility best practice is to send reminders and follow up. To encourage participation, plan to send one or two reminders during the survey period. These reminders should be spaced out and sent close to the survey's closing date. A gentle nudge can significantly increase response rates by catching those who intended to participate but hadn't yet found the time. The next distribution and accessibility best practice is to offer incentives. Offering incentives can be a powerful motivator for participation. Whether it's a chance to win a prize or a small reward for completing the survey, ensure that any incentives are ethically appropriate and do not coerce participation. The goal is to encourage, not compel, honest and thoughtful responses. 
The final distribution and accessibility best practice is personalized correspondence. Personalization makes communication more effective. Whenever possible, address the survey invitations and reminders personally. Instead of like, dear student, write dear name, right? Use form, field, merge, and things like that. This touch of personalization can significantly enhance engagement and shows respondents that their input is valued on an individual level. By adhering to these distribution and accessibility best practices, we not only increase the likelihood of a high response rate, but also ensure that our survey process is inclusive and respectful of all participants. Remember, the goal of our survey is to gather data that reflects the diverse experiences and needs of our entire student population or whatever population that we're studying. So ensuring that every student can participate and feels valued in the process is crucial to achieving this goal. Now, as we design and distribute our surveys, it is paramount to approach our work with a deep sense of ethics and sensitivity. This section of our, of our webinar delves into the practices that ensure our surveys respect the dignity, privacy, and diversity of all participants. Let's explore the best practices for ethics and sensitivity in survey creation. <clears throat> First up is informed consent. At the forefront of ethical survey practices is, is obtaining informed consent. It's crucial to clearly explain the purpose of your survey, how the data will be used, and any measures in place to protect, to protect confidentiality. So this transparency allows participants to make an informed decision about their involvement. For surveys including minors, obtaining consent from parents or guardians is also necessary. So ensuring that consent is informed and voluntary upholds the respect and autonomy of each participant. Now in a school setting, if you were trying to understand and prove, you know, whatever programs you have on campus, there is some informed consent sort of already built into the student um, sort of participation level. But if you're doing a massive research study, you know, and you have institutional review board approvals, informed consent is highly critical and necessary. If none of these words make sense to you, that's okay. That may be more advanced than you need right now. The next ethics and sensitivity best practice is to allow anonymous responses. Anonymity can be a significant factor in encouraging honest and open responses, especially in surveys addressing sensitive topics or seeking feedback. When designing your survey, consider whether anonymity is essential and, if so, ensure that it's maintained. Anonymity helps participants feel safe in sharing their true thoughts and experiences, which in turn enriches the data collected. An example for anonymous responses, in a survey asking students about their mental health during the semester, you decide to make responses anonymous to encourage honesty and to reduce potential stigma. So to maintain an, an, an anonymity, you avoid collecting any personal identifying information and reassure participants in the survey introduction that their responses cannot be traced back to them. This practice leads to a higher response rate and more candid disclosures providing valuable insights into student well-being. The next ethics and, sens and sensitivity best practice is to keep in the forefront ethical considerations. So ethical considerations are particularly crucial when surveys touch on sensitive topics or involve small demographic groups. It's important to handle such data with the utmost of care, report responses responsibly, and ensure that the privacy and dignity of participants are preserved. Seeking approval from an ethics committee can provide valuable guidance and reassurance that your survey meets the highest ethical standards. The next ethics and sensitivity best practice is to maintain cultural sensitivity. Recognizing and respecting cultural differences is essential in the design and administration of surveys. Questions should be crafted to be culturally inclusive, avoiding language or assumptions that could perpetuate stereotypes or bias. Being culturally sensitive ensures that your survey is accessible and meaningful to a diverse participant base, allowing for a richer and more nuanced understanding of the data collected. Here's an example. 
When designing a survey on student experiences about campus inclusivity, you include questions about cultural events and representation. To ensure cultural sensitivity, you consult with student groups from diverse backgrounds to review your questions. Their feedback leads you to rephrase a question from, do you feel your culture is represented in campus events, to, how well do you feel campus events represent a range of cultures, including yours? This rephrasing acknowledges the diversity of student experiences and avoids assuming a baseline of representation. The final ethics and sensitivity best practice is placement of demographic data questions. Placing demographic, demographic questions at the end of your survey is a strategic choice that minimizes the risk of stereotype threat. This is a phenomenon where individuals might feel at risk of confirming stereotypes about their social group. This careful placement helps ensure that participants feel comfortable and judged of the responses rather than their demographics. So when anonymity is not a primary concern, using identifiers like student ID numbers for demographic cross-referencing can maintain confidentiality while allowing for detailed analysis. We always encourage, especially when you're trying to understand students and, and their needs and experiences, we recommend being able to disaggregate by more than just gender. You want to disaggregate at the intersections of gender and race and other kinds of things. So that kind of data is important, but always ask it last. And if you don't have to ask it, if you can use a student ID then and cross-reference, then that's going to be a better solution for you. And wrapping up, the ethical and sensitive handling of surveys is not just a best practice, but a fundamental responsibility. By embracing these principles, we ensure our surveys are not only effective tools for gathering data, but also instruments of respect and inclusion, reflecting our commitment to the dignity and diversity of all participants. Now, in the final phase of our survey process, we focus on analyzing the data collected and providing valuable feedback. This step is crucial in translating the responses into actionable insights and closing the loop with our participants. Let's delve into the best practices for analysis and feedback that ensure our surveys not only collect data, but also contribute to meaningful change. So first up is a data analysis plan. The first step towards effective analysis is developing a clear and straightforward plan from the get-go. This plan should outline how you intend to analyze the data to answer your research questions. In today's digital age, leveraging AI tools for analyzing open-ended responses can be incredibly powerful. These tools can help identify patterns, sentiments, and themes that might not be immediately apparent, providing deeper insights into the respondents' perspectives. Here's an example. When planning to analyze survey data on student preferences for course formats, online, hybrid, and person, you outline a plan that includes descriptive statistics for overall per preferences and cross-tabulation to examine preferences by major. Recognizing the potential for open-ended responses to provide deeper insights, you also plan to use text analysis software to identify common themes and sentiments. This structured approach to analysis ensures that you can effectively interpret the data and make informed decisions on course offerings. The next analysis and feedback best practice is data preparation. Once your survey is complete, the next step is to download the data from your survey software and organize it into a structured spreadsheet. This organization is vital and it prepares your data for analysis, allowing for more efficient and accurate interpretation. Given that most survey tools offer limited analysis features, especially for disaggregated data, setting up your spreadsheet in a way that facilitates your analysis plan is crucial. Now, if you're thinking, I have no idea how to do that, the next step is to ask for help to seek assistance. Data analysis can be daunting, particularly if you're not familiar with statistical methods or the software that you're using. It's important to remember that seeking assistance is not only okay, but encouraged. Whether it's guidance on setting up your spreadsheet, using statistical software, or interpreting the results, asking for help ensures that your analysis is both confident and accurate. There are many resources available from online tutorials to academic consultants, so don't hesitate to utilize them. 
The final analysis and feedback best practice is feedback and follow-up. One of the most overlooked yet significant aspects of conducting a survey is providing feedback to your participants, to your respondents. Sharing the results and what actions you plan to take based on the feedback can greatly increase engagement and trust in the process. It shows respondents that their input is valued and has a tangible impact, which can encourage participation in future surveys. This feedback loop is essential, not just for transparency, but also for fostering a sense of community and collaboration between you and the respondents. In summary, the analysis and feedback stage is about more than just crunching numbers. It's about understanding the story behind the data and engaging with your respondents in meaningful ways. By following these best practices, you ensure that your survey is not only gathering data, but also contributes to informed decision-making and ongoing dialogue with your participants. Now, as we've navigated through the essentials of crafting effective and inclusive student surveys, it's clear that the journey doesn't end here. So to further enhance the quality and impact of your surveys, advancing your skills is key. Let's explore some advanced survey development skills that can elevate your surveys from good to great. And again, these are skills that you learn. So it's not something that you could just pick up, right? Um, Most likely. So firstly, questionnaire design expertise. Beyond basic question construction lies the art of designing questions that accurately measure what they're intended to. This includes using advanced question types such as matrix questions, slider scales, or rank ordering, and designing adaptive questions that branch based on previous responses. Mastery in questionnaire design allows for a deeper and more nuanced understanding of student perspectives. Understanding and minimizing bias is another crucial skill. It involves recognizing different types of biases like response bias or sampling bias and employing strategies to mitigate them. This includes using neutral wording and avoiding leading questions, ensuring your survey data is as accurate and representative as possible. Next, sampling and population knowledge. Effective surveys rely on a sample that that accurately reflects the population you're studying. This means having a solid grasp of sample size determination and understanding different sampling methods, whether random, stratified, or convenient sampling, to ensure your sample is representative. Advanced data analysis and interpretation skills are also vital. With the right statistical analysis techniques, such as regression analysis or factor analysis, you can interpret data more accurately and draw valid conclusions. Proficiency with statistical software tools is, a, is essential for analyzing complex data sets and uncovering insights that drive informed decision making. Furthermore, survey testing and validation ensure that your survey instrument measures what it's supposed to. This involves conducting pilot tests to refine questions and format, validating the survey instrument, and performing reliability tests to check for consistency over time. Now, in most cases, in my experience working with educators, this level is not needed. We're just trying to gather some information to help us make some informed decisions. But typically, the sort of validated instrument to ascertain participation in a welding program is not required. Next, ethical considerations and compliance cannot be overstated. So as survey complexity increases, so does the importance of adhering to ethical standards, privacy laws, and ensuring informed consent and respond at confidentiality. Compliance with data protection regulations like GDPR is crucial for maintaining trust and legality. Lastly, the move towards multimodal survey development recognizes the diverse ways in which respondents can engage with surveys, designing and deploying surveys across multiple platforms while ensuring consistency and comparability of data. This challenges us to be innovative and adaptable. And let's not forget the importance of cultural competency and inclusivity in survey design. Ensuring our surveys are sensitive to and inclusive of diverse languages and cultural context. By developing these advanced skills, you'll be equipped to design sophisticated and reliable surveys capable of providing high quality data for informed decision making, policy development, and research. The journey towards excellence in survey design is ongoing, and each step forward enriches our ability to create meaningful and impactful educational experiences. 
Now, uh, some of the resources that I drew upon for these best, best practices are um, the well-known Creswell book, Educational Research Planning, Conducting and Evaluating Quantitative and Qualitative Research, uh, Designing Surveys from uh, Shiza and Blair, um, and then Qualitative Research and Evaluation Methods by Patton. I've also included on this list a great resource on inter- Introduction to Intersectional Qualitative Research by Esposito and Evans Winters, uh, another great resource that I encourage you read to support uh, your work. And remember, a quick and easy way to check in is to ask if your survey cares. Is it concise, accessible, relevant, ethical, and simple? As we conclude our webinar, and remember that developing effective student surveys is a skill that improves with practice. By applying the principles and practices, you're taking a significant step towards creating surveys that truly reflect and meet the needs of your students. So thank you for tuning in. But before I close, I want to thank the Toyota USA Foundation and the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity for funding this work. We hope you found this information valuable and feel inspired to implement these best practices and your future survey projects. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.